Welcome back. So last module, what I did is we went through how biometricians use information on phenotypic similarity among relatives, and, and mostly we focused on twins, monozygotic and dizygotic twins, how they can use that information to get an estimate of heritability, where heritability is the proportion of variance in a phenotype that's associated with genetic factors. Because they need to make assumptions in order to estimate the heritability, we recognize that the heritability estimate itself is probably at best an approximation of some true value. So we need to be cautious when looking at particular heritability estimates, not to overinterpret them. What then is the utility of, of estimating heritability? Well, I'm going to try to explain what the utility of estimating heritability is, first by telling you what I don't think heritability is. These are things or uh, problems that have come up over the years, how I think heritability coefficient has been misinterpreted. And at the end, I'll try to uh, give you reasons why I think it's useful to know, at least approximately, the extent to which genetic factors might contribute to individual differences in a behavioral trait, the heritability coefficient. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the heritability is not an index of whether or not a phenotype can be changed by intervention. This is a common mistake that's made over and over again. But I'm going to give an old example of this. It's, I, it's kind of an interesting example. And this is um, a, a quote from a, a, an article that was published ooh, quite a few years ago in uh, the Times of London. And what the article was about was a, a very large twin study. I think it was a registry-based twin study. It was done in Europe in which they did a twin study of income levels. And what they observed was, not surprisingly, hopefully to you at this point, is that monozygotic twins were more correlated in their income levels than dizygotic twins. So that income levels were heritable. And they, in the study, actually, I, don't, I, I can't recall exactly what the heritability estimate is. It's really not that important at this point. But the, the study reported that a heritability estimate for your income level. And the way the Times of London interpreted this very large study of twins is that the findings, the finding, what's the finding here? The, that income level is heritable. The findings are a significant matter of social policy because it implies that we can't make society more equal. That is, we can't equalize income levels because they're somehow coded in our genes. So that the finding that income levels were heritable meant that we couldn't change income levels, that they're somehow predestined in our genes. Not the case. Well, you might think, well, this is a journalist making kind of a rookie mistake. This is not something that really sophisticated scientists would ever do. Well, here's a quote from a very prominent and, and deservedly prominent uh, psychologist that actually accompanied uh, the Times article. Hans Eysenck is one of the most famous um, individual differences psychologists of the 20th century. He made many, many important contributions to the field. But look what he says. It really tells the Royal Commission on the Distribution of Income and Wealth that they might as well pack up. Income is heritable. Therefore, nothing we can do about it. It's in your genes. Not the case. And to illustrate it's not the case, let's take something that almost nobody would argue is not heritable, height. Here's a study uh, from actually a friend of mine, uh, a, a well-known uh, Finnish geneticist, Kari, I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing his last name, Silvertonian. Um, and Kari has collected uh, from various countries a very large sample of twins, and he's measured their similarity for height. And he's here, I'm just taking from his article here, the estimates of, these are added genetic variant estimates of height for men and women across these various countries. And, and, and the point here, obviously, is that height, not surprisingly, is a very highly heritable trait. It looks to be 75 to even maybe as much as 90% heritable. Height is highly heritable. But if we take the logic from the previous slide, does that mean height is something that's fixed, that our environments can't change? Well, no. One thing that's been happening in all these European countries is that height has been going up. And this is from an article actually 
published in 2013, a review article, very nice review article if you're interested in height, of increases in the average height. These are mostly based on males. And the reason they're based on males, the same thing is going on with females, but the reason they're based on males is uh, the data come from, cons usually often from conscript boards. And usually only males are conscripted uh, going into the military. And you can see for country after country, this is spanning quite a, a, a large uh, historical period, but for country after country, the average height of, a, of an adult male has been increasing. In fact, over the last 100 years, the average male in Europe has grown by 11 centimeters. That's a phenomenal increase in height. Height is a highly heritable trait. Nonetheless, height has been changing over time. Highly heritable does not mean fixed. It doesn't mean it's unchangeable. Height has been changing. And it's been changing not because our genomes, our genomes don't change that fast over the past 100 years. It is because our environments have changed. Better public health, better control of infection, better diet has, has led to, to increases in height. So high heritability is not in, incompatible with, in, with things being environmentally manipulable, something that we'll talk about again, in particular when we talk about IQ. This is, I think, a mistake that comes back over and over again when people talk about the heritability of IQ. As you will see, IQ is a heritable trait, but it doesn't mean that IQ is not changeable although some people have argued that. So the first thing that heritability is not, it's not an index of whether or not you can or cannot change a, tra a trait. The second thing it's not, it's not a biological constant. That is, the heritability applies to a certain population at a certain period of time. It can change if situation changes. And I'm gonna illustrate this with a study, a, a study I kinda like about, the, this is the heritability of reading. So it's whether or not how well children are reading. And in this case, they're looking at kindergartners. So they're about five years old. And they're looking at three different countries. And these are three different large twin studies, one in Australia, one in the US, one in Sweden. And what they've done is they've applied the Faulkner model to the MZ and DZ correlations and generated an estimate of additive genetic effect, the A estimate, and shared environmental effect. And of course, there's a non-shared environmental effect, but I'm just not giving it here because every, uh, all the important information is here. Look at the heritability estimates in the different countries. What is the heritability of reading? Well, clearly the heritability of reading is different in Australia than it is in Sweden. So there's not one heritability estimate here. And also, actually, the shared environmental effect differs from across the three countries. So these variance components, there aren't fixed biological constants. They actually can vary. They can vary over region. They can vary historically. They can vary developmentally. Now I'm gonna come back to this example in a couple minutes because it's actually a beautiful, I think a beautiful example of why the heritability estimate is a worthwhile statistic. What is heritability used for? I gave you the quote, uh, I think in the last module, from the Nature Reviews genetics article that said, this is a very important statistic that even though we have challenges in estimating it, we really need to pay attention to it. Why do geneticists, quantitative geneticists feel that? First, it gives us an approximate sense of the importance of genetic factors to individual differences in a particular point in time in a particular environment. Secondly, and this is why there's been somewhat of a resurgence in the interest in heritability, because now, as you'll see, as we get later into the course, we can actually begin to get down at the genome level to identify the specific genetic effects that might be underlying individual differences in, in, in uh, behavior. Heritability is an index that actually molecular geneticists are interested in because it tells us something about whether or not they're likely to identify those genetic effects. The third reason I think heritability is useful is by comparing that it's not a biological constant actually can be very informative. And to illustrate this, I'd like to go back to that reading study. The reading study was actually a longitudinal study, and I've given you the citation if you want to look at the study. It's actually, I think, a very interesting and nice study. 
they, what they did is they came back in first grade and they redid the reading achievement measure. Now the twins are in grade school, first grade. And look at what happens to the heritability estimates now. They don't vary across the countries. And heritability estimates are actually quite high. They're all about 80%. And the shared environmental effects are all now consistently low. Well, what was going on here? Why were you getting the differences here, but all of a sudden not here? Why are the heritability estimates here high and the shared environmental estimates low, but larger shared environmental effects here? Well, what happens, it turns out, relates to how children are treated in the different countries. In Australia, in the U.S., kidney gardeners, there is a curriculum for reading in kindergarten. So all of the twins, when they're going to kindergarten, are getting the same standard curriculum for teaching them how to read. In Sweden, there's no such curriculum for reading in kindergartners. They don't think it's important for a five-year-old to read. So they don't try to teach them in kindergarten whether or not to read. Consequently, whether or not an individual in Sweden, a five-year-old, learns to read is going to be dependent upon his or her parents, what happens in the home. But for people in Australia, or for five-year-olds in Australia, in the U.S., they're not dependent on their home. They're, they're going to learn to read at school. So what happens is the heritability is high here because it doesn't depend upon what's going on in home. It's low here, and the shared environmental effect is high because whether or not they read depends upon whether, how they're being treated at home. When they come back in first grade, now Sweden, as well as the U.S. and Australia, have a standard curriculum that every child will get in order to learn to read. Now, whether or not a Swedish six-year-old reads doesn't depend upon how he or she is treated at home. They're all going to learn how to read by what they get in their, their curriculum at school. So the heritability estimates are high. The shared environmental effects are low. So by looking at the comparisons of the heritability, they're beginning to give us insights as to what's going on with reading and the, the relative contribution of what's going on at home versus at school and how those impact shared environmental effects and heritable effects. Next time, we're going to look at something that we actually assume doesn't exist in generating the heritability estimates, a very important concept, gene-environment interaction.